Welcome Jeff Merrick to the Stumble Forward. Jeff is a much-loved Canadian hockey and sports broadcaster and podcaster. He started out as the host of Live Audio Wrestling and the Leafs mm. Lunch. He's had turns at the Fan 590, Toxic Sporty, Mojo Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, Sportsnet, pre- and post-game shows for Toronto Maple Leaf telecasts, Hockey Night in Canada, and also called Judo at the 2008 Summer Olympics for the CBC. <laughs> He's currently heard on his own The Jeff Merrick Show and 32 Thoughts podcast with Elliot Friedman. Please welcome Jeff Merrick. Jeff. It, it is incredible how you know my bio and my resume way more than I do. I'm hearing you, Hawk, like list all these things off that I've done. I've forgotten half of them. I guess that's a combination of age and going through a pandemic, I suppose. I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot that I did that. Oh yeah. How you doing, Hawk? Good to talk to I you. I mean, it's interesting. It's great to talk to you. I had a friend over who's, whose wife is um, in broadcasting here in Peterborough. Okay. And um, I was just talking about how broadcasters bounce around a lot. And when I was going through your bio, it was quite surprising to see just how many turns there can be for yeah. somebody like you who's kind of moving up the ranks. Um, did it feel as busy and as change heavy as, as it sort of looks on paper? No, and you know why? Because I've never set a goal. I've never been someone that sets goals. I've always kind of looked at setting a goal along the lines of making a friend with the anticipation that the friendship's going to end one day. So I've never set goals. I've just sort of woken up every morning and said, I'm going to try to be, try to work hard, be as authentic as I can, genuine as I can. And I'm just going to see where this takes me because I assure you, I was trained for none of it. This is a completely accidental career. I was working at a cemetery back in 94 when I stumbled into this business working uh, overnights as a call screener with the fan. And then, you know, I wanted to go go back to university at Guelph and do my master's, and maybe someday a PhD and walk the groves of academe, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I just kept sort of climbing up the ladder and every year was another step. And I kept saying, I'm going to go back next year. I'm going to go back next year and hawk somewhere along the way. I stopped saying I was ever going to go back and here I am. Like none of this was planned. None of this was a goal. Mm. That's always just been, okay, now I'm going to do this. And my highlight was probably getting fired on the fridge one day. My first firing. Everyone's got a firing story you'll find in broadcasting. My first firing story, I was 94. I was working at The Fan. And I was doing a show with George Strombolopoulos and Bob Mackowitz Jr. I got a call from George about a year into our tenure. And he said, have you talked to Nelson, our program director? And I said, no. And he said, well, uh, you might want to call him because he just got fired. And I said, what do you mean I got fired? I haven't talked to Nelson. There's nothing on my answering machine. He's like, they put a note up on the fridge, effective immediately. The services of Jeff Merrick are no longer necessary or needed, blah, blah, blah. George continues to do the basketball show or whatever. And so my first firing hawk was on the fridge. That's how the career started. How about that? I mean, it seems that firings in the in the media business are rather inelegant. Um, so this, this is no not surprising that you found. There's no graceful What's that, way. sorry? There's no graceful way to do it. There's no graceful way. There's, no, there's no good way. Things got to change. Right. Um, I met you uh, a couple of years ago when uh, 32 Thoughts came through on a pre-game or a pre-season kind of tour of Ontario. Yeah. Uh, at yeah. And you invited me out to chat, which I loved. And I guess what I'm interested in is that I did hear of an exceptionally smart, uh, clever, well-spoken, erudite character in you and thought, well, hell, what is this guy's story? So to be honest with you, for the last two years, I've had a curiosity about yeah. how somebody like you stumbles into what it is you're doing, because quite honestly, you talking about, you know, your your walks in academe there, I kind of am trying to understand in some ways, unpack and reverse how the whole academe thing started. What were you studying? I mean, I seem to re even remember at that event, you quoting Shakespeare and some other sort of- So, so pretentious. Thought, well, like just awful, It's not pretentious. Right? Like, it's just so lovely. pretentious. And then as Yates once cleverly said, like, come on, man. <laughs> like, you know, I, I used to always joke, I'm trying to educate myself out of a job. I, uh, I was an English major with a philosophy minor, and I guess somehow through hockey, I got to get in. I got to get on my pretentious quotes uh, somehow. But no, I was I was a student, and I thought that I was going to be that conference hopping professor one day, tenured prof, and live the uh, the life of academe. And my my whole life, I was always a you know, I was just a hockey fan. Like I'm not really. It, it's weird. Like I'm not a sports guy. I'm just a hockey fan. Like if it wasn't hockey, I would be doing something completely not related to sports at all. I enjoy watching a baseball game. 
Uh, I enjoy watching the Olympics. I enjoy like big sporting events, but I'm not like a sports fan. I'm a hockey fan mm. and I've been my entire life and I can still recall my parents, you know, taking me to the Hockey Hall of Fame back when it was the CNE. I'd be like seven or eight years old, have like a little note, have like a little notepad with a pencil and they would drop me off and they would like leave to go on the rides and the food building and, and all those types of things. And, you know, little Jeffy would be there writing down all this, obviously well pre-internet. So all the information I could gather was from various magazines and going to the Hall of Fame and they would leave me there all day. Like that's probably why they're never on the cover of today's parent magazine granted, but still like I was, I was happy like that. I'm watching all these videos. I'm writing everything down. Like to me, that was heaven. And I've always had this wonder and this curiosity about the game, both backwards and forwards. That's just sort of always been, I never thinking for one second was going to be a career. Again, this is quite accidental. And if it wasn't for hockey, I wouldn't probably be doing anything in sports at all. And was there a, a want to play hockey or was this sort of like archivist, uh, deep, you know, philosophical kid? Like, were you looking at <laughs> hockey not I necessarily played. as somebody who wanted to? Yeah. Was that, sorry? I, I, no, I, I played. Uh, I wasn't, you, you know, play. I wasn't great. I was a goaltender. Um, the most contemplative of all the positions. Um, yes. You know, what do you call the people that athletes hang out with? Goaltenders. Um, so oh, I was a man, goalie. that's a drummer joke. Yeah. <laughs> do, they, do they have the, 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 the joke about drummers like they do with a defenseman? What's a defenseman? Oh, I just said dumb forward. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so I was, I was a goalie and, uh, when I was 16 years old, I didn't get drafted in the OHL. I went through like personal tragedy that year. My mother passed away of, of brain cancer. And like, that was it for me. Like my whole life, like I'm just like 16 years old, like a young dude coming into trying to trans transform from, from being a boy to a man and all this happens. And I ended up quitting hockey. And then the weirdest thing happened to me. And this is why I'll always, any, anyone that's followed my hockey career for any number of years has known that I've always cited 1987 as the best year of hockey. Uh, and I still do believe that there was the Canada cup. Uh, there was a great seven game series between the Oilers and the Philadelphia Flyers um, there was the Easter Epic uh, that year as well. Like there was so many great events. Canada Cup was the best hockey that maybe has ever been played. Um, and that was a year that sort of, I don't know, I felt, and I kind of still do, um, as pretentious as this may sound, that it kind of brought me back. Because in 1986, my whole world fell apart. In 1987, hockey said, hang on a second. Hockey's really good. Come on back. Even if you don't want to play, at least come back here. This is how good all of this can be. And I've always cited 87 for, I guess, a lot of it for personal reasons. But legitimately, I always believe that 1987 was was the best year for hockey. But it, it was the one that brought me back when I stopped my playing career. And now I'm just a bad beer league, turn the puck over, overhandle the puck in front of my net kind of defenseman now. But that was the year that it, that it, that it brought me back. It's fascinating. <clears throat> I think I mentioned to you that I married into a hockey family. I asked my dad yeah. in the early 80s, both my brother and I, because all our friends played hockey, and we just asked if we could play hockey. And he said no. Um, and I think in some ways he didn't want to be involved in hockey culture, which yeah. I can understand now with some hindsight. Now I'm an uncle with a nephew who is very heavy into hockey. And like I said, I married into this hockey family. Mm -hmm. it's, it's golf heavy. It's, it's hockey heavy. And... I think, you know, as a young guy, I, I love excellence. It doesn't matter what. That's why I'm interested in you. I'm interested in excellence. That's why I have this podcast. I just love people who are unique, individual, and who do something at a very high level. Hmm. So um, my interest in sports, similar to you, you'd said you weren't a sports fan. You were a hockey fan. I've, I'm yeah. interested in the excellence side of, of sport and always have been. I think as a young artist, there was this sense that I had to protect myself um, and had to sort of front that I wasn't interested in sport and wasn't interested in these things. But, you know, secretly behind closed doors, when I'm left alone with YouTube, like I'm watching boxing highlights and I'm watching yeah. UFC stuff and I'm watching, there's this guy with a great philosophical hockey channel that I sort of watch just to keep up because when my family visits for dinner, I need to sound like I know a little bit of what's going on in the sports sure. world or else there is no conversation. All of that just to say that sport through the lens of excellence is something I've I'm right on board with. And this sense that as an artist, I shouldn't have ever tangled with sport because it would it was off brand for me. It seems ridiculous mm -hmm. in hindsight. Does any of this resonate for you? It does. I understand that. Um, I've kind of looked at, I've always looked at art and science, for example, as doing the same thing, just describing what's there. It uses different language. It uses different tools. 
but you know what you do musically i don't necessarily see that different than what someone else uses with numbers and we all know at a certain point you know math becomes phil- theoretical and you know art becomes mathematical at a, at a certain intersection mm. when you take it to its sort of ex- extremes right yep. and i think that's that intersection point that's i think fascinating for a lot of us sports is is, is its own type of physical language and there's a lot built into it and this is i think part of the attractiveness as well i think a lot of it just sort of describes who the athletes are as people and who they are as people at that point in their life you know i got some great advice once from a yoga teacher and it was this this woman who was she was like spectacular she was the kind of person that you just can't help but hating she's so perfect you know clear mind expanded vision wonderfully athletic like just a charming eloquent speaker all of it and we we're talking about my career and she said how do you handle criticism and i said well i've chosen this right it's like the line from the godfather this is the business we chose like i chose this i chose to stick my head up above the crowd i gotta expect that someone's gonna throw a rock so to me it's sort of baked into the pie and she said something that i never forget as she's eating this like green apple and i never forget she gets a big bite of the apple after she makes this profound comment she says to me you know what you're gonna find not just in your career but in life is you're gonna find people who love you and you're gonna find people who hate you. And the main thing that you need to remember is none of it has anything to do with you. That's just where they're at in their life. And I always think of that when I see athletes perform. Now their language is Mm. physical, not unlike, like I'm a huge fan. I don't know if you remember a dance troupe out of Montreal called La 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 Human Steps. Louise LeCavalier, who to me was this, and she was on the, the Class Spider tour with David Bowie. She, Bowie brought them along uh, and was on, on stage with them through the, through the entire show. And Louise LeCavalier, to me, was fascinating. She was this, like, she was like an incredible shape, really physical dancing, like violent, violent dancing, bodies smashing together. And she's just like, torn up like a bad report card like just like it's just like you see every tiny little muscle it's 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 beautiful in its violence and i always looked at sports as having a sort of physical language about it and that is the expression of who these people are at this point in their life they're describing their life experience physically because probably they can't vocally and sometimes they can't even understand what they're doing which is why I always find the walk-off interview fascinating because the answer is always, I don't know how that happened. The game spoke me. I have a history of training and then the game takes over. I have all these rules in my head and from there I just sort of freestyle. Um, But don't ask me what happened. I just did that or rather the game did that to me and I was just prepared to react to it. So I kind of look at sports as having its own language. I still don't understand all of it. And that's still part of the wonder and the fascination for me. I still don't get any of it. And I'll probably, you know, take this one to the crematorium too. Like I'll probably, you know, go to my deathbed, not understanding it fully. And that's okay because every now and then you get a glimpse, you get a little like aha moment, like, okay. And everything sort of works and you understand it for that brief moment. And then it goes away again, like a melody rising and falling and rising and falling. Mm. That's kind of how I, well, hockey specifically, that's kind of how I see the game. And that's why I think the best broadcasters aren't the ones so ones so much, God, is this going to sound pretentious, that call the game, but more that sing the game, because that's really what's going on. I don't know if that makes any sense. Uh, it makes some, it, it makes uh, complete sense. Again, this is, I think, why my attraction to what it was you're doing was ignited in that moment of meeting you a couple of years ago was everything you said about your yoga teacher, the bright, quick mind. I thought, man, what an intimidating force this guy is. Like, all of a sudden, I'm in the room with somebody whose mind is 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 really crunching through images and simile and like you're you're there's a dynamism in the way you understand hockey and your empathy for it and then all of a sudden you have this artfulness in your language and you're able to kind of create a like a, a truly dynamic universe to operate and uh, sort of speak and observe within and I, as, as an outsider who didn't really know your work or you before this i was like man this guy is an unbelievable talent like <laughs> I, and and it was i was intimidated it's, by just how quick it all was and how and also how you retain a lot of stats and then i'll also say because i was listening to some of your podcast stuff you have an empathy for the players and their families i couldn't believe the amount of 
players' names you remember, you know their state of affairs, you know their state of health, and then you'd, oh, and I know the dad's name, and I know the mom's name because I met them. So, and you somehow, when I'm listening to these podcasts, I'm listening to a very human and humane rendering of sort of the sports idiom, in my opinion. Like, are you cognizant of that? Am I getting somewhere near to what it is you know you're doing, or am I out to lunch? Yeah, no, no, no. I um, It's interesting, too, because when I was a kid, I was all about like what you're talking about, the stats, the stats, and give me the numbers. And I need to know how many shutouts Terry Sawchuk had and how many wins Tony Esposito had and how many goals Guy Lafleur had and how many records Wayne Gretzky has. Like I, For whatever reason, you know, it all gets caught up in identity too, right? Um, I needed to, to know all that. That was, that was part of who I am. And then the, the older I get, um, the less I care about that. And I care more about yeah. the stories and I care more about the people. And I care, like, I have this, the older I get, and I think we all have this struggle. And I know I do with hockey, which is a very, very complicated sport, considering everything that it's gone through and continues to go through. Um, the way I feel about sports, and specifically hockey, is it exists right here. There's what your head knows, and there's what your heart feels. And sports is in between. There's a lot of things that happen in sports, specifically hockey, that my head can't justify. And as a as an adult, I cannot, to you, Hawk, philosophically justify what I see sometimes on the ice. Some of the some of the behavior I get, it, especially knowing what we know now about things like CTE, for example. But then, I'm not going to lie to you, play stops. Two guys throw their gloves off and they fade back to center ice. That's where your heart says, okay, head, take a break here because I'm going to take over. And I always felt that hockey, since it is a, a flow sport and not a static sport, and I think that's a big part of where the, a lot of the violence comes from too, um, is that intersection between what your head knows but your heart feels. And that's the tug because my head can't justify it. My heart says, oh, yeah, over here I can because this is how I feel. This is what I know, but this is what I feel. Who wins that tug? Sometimes it's your head, sometimes it's your heart. While the game is going on, it's your heart. When the game is after, it's usually your head. And I think that's yeah. part of the, why I think a lot of people, and I include myself, myself in that, are conflicted sometimes about what happens on the ice. You feel the same way? Um, I've, I, you know, I, I, I will say this, I've had the, the my sense is that ho that many sports have one or two elements of frustration. You're bouncing a ball in basketball and then trying to get it in the hoop, but yep. you're still on your own feet. I've always said about hockey, I think there's a lot of fighting because there's three elements of frustration. You have to stick handle, you get hit, especially when your head's not up and you have to shoot the thing. And then you're having to do all of this on skates, which to me has a fundamental like human frustration level that would yep. bring me to the brink. With that said, just even talking this out with you, the skates allow for a certain freedom that almost belies your connection to your own human body. You're moving like a bird all of a sudden. So all of mm -hmm. a sudden your, your mind is possibly even contextually thinking, okay, well, I have left my body and I am now sort of operating in some astral ethereal, you know, situation. Why am I tethered to this cumbersome thing? Like, you know, to go one step even further spiritually. But n my sense is... Man, the whole the fighting thing, and I'm sorry to get so circuitous because I just saw a peace okay. game I'm, a few weeks this. ago. There was a there, there was a fight, and I really analyzed my own feeling too because a, a real darkness came over the, in the entire arena. I could feel it's like the 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 temperature changed, and we mm -hmm. we wanted that fight. We wanted these young gladiators to perform in that way in front of us. Yeah. Um, and and I struggle with this because I love sport. I love excellence at that high level. I love the meritocratic universe that sport is. I wish we could import some of that into music. You know, I sort of feel like music is getting more and more planned, more and more treated and tuned and fixed, while sport remains gloriously untethered, serendipitous, dangerous, wild, and exciting. Um, music could use a lot of that. I think I'm not getting anywhere to make a point about this, Jeff, only that the way I watch the fighting, the hockey, the way mm. I'm analyzing how people are reacting to this situation. Um, and then 
even watching these young kids, as I watch the Pete's, I don't see live hockey as much as I see the Pete's play and I see them play yeah. quite regularly. And I think about the dreams that are on the ice there. I think about the, 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 the narrative trajectories of all those young kids' lives all coming together for this sort of somewhat preposterous event that we are also emotionally invested in. It's, it's bloody exciting and yeah. I think it's elemental. So there's a few things there that I want to pull out if I can. So to the Please point, do. to the point about, and I've, I've never heard it, but I'm going to really take some time tonight and think about what you said about the presence of skates and the the fact that you move at a uh, at a rate that you can't when you're just in your running shoes. I mean, I, I never considered that to make you feel as if you were other than human. But there's one other. There's a couple of other places that I really think contribute to the rules don't apply here feeling mm. about hockey mm. because that really is i think a lot of ways what we're getting at here now yeah let me go let me go back so i don't consider myself or have, i don't think i've ever done anything that anyone would confuse with art all i do is make frames that's what i do as a podcaster as a broad i just make frames that go around the art now the art the, the frames say okay now the art stops here and life begins there and the frame is the sort of that place that says okay here's where one thing stops and another thing begins and i kind of look at hockey and, and what you're talking about, about this no rules apply area or the regular rules of polite society don't apply here. There is physically, physically, and this doesn't happen in baseball. This doesn't happen in basketball. This doesn't happen in football. Like go around and think about all the sports that we watch. There are physical boundaries. There's boards mm -hmm. and there's glass. And on the other side is the real world. I'm saying mentally, like in your head, as you're out there, you are in one world, they are in another. This is the sort of the morality and the set of rules that you have for this world. Their rules don't apply here. Things that we allow to happen to ourselves and things we allow ourselves to do to others on the ice, we would never think of, I hope, doing to someone on the other side of that glass. I think that is a contributing factor to why things get so goofy. The other thing is, as I mentioned, it is a flow sport. A lot of other sports, football, for example, you can probably say, well, how come there's not big brawls in football? It's physical. Yes, but it's a stop and start sport. And it's like five seconds, mm -hmm. cloud of dust, stop. Five seconds, cloud of dust, stop. It is quick. This goes on and on and on as emotion. And to your point, frustration, which is a big one. I'm glad you brought that up. Frustration comes on and on and on and the shift continues and there's a change and there hasn't been a whistle for a pause and it continues and it builds and it builds and it builds. And at some point there needs to be relief of that tension. Sometimes it's a goal. Sometimes it's a body check. Sometimes it's a penalty. Sometimes the puck just goes off into the stands or sometimes it's a fight. There's a lot of sort of release valves that are that are built into, I think, successful flow sports. Now, it doesn't happen as often mm. as it used to. Um, I, I do think, and I used to be one of these guys that, you know, really enjoyed the, the fighting side of things. Trust me, I was part of a tape collection, like back when I was in high school, with this, this guy out of Hartford who had the most ironic name of all time. You'll love this one, Hawk. The guy out of Hartford, they used to coordinate this, this hockey fight tape ring. And I was a Toronto correspondent. His name, um, oh, what was his name again? Uh, Sandy Vigilante. No joke. The guy, and the, the <laughs> CBC did a documentary on the guy. You can find it online. Sandy Vigilante. I think it was out of Hartford or was it Long Island? I can't recall. Anyway, so I've got stacks and stacks and stacks and, and going back. And that's why I always say the game right now has more respect in it than it's ever been. Back then, half the league should have been incarcerated. But I really do think that what you were hinting at a couple of seconds ago, what you're getting at, is there is this sort of sense of it is a completely different world. Unlike other sports where you can literally run into the stands and there is that contact with the quote unquote real world that doesn't happen in hockey to say nothing of the fact that they put on uniforms when and I used to always, you know, uh, I remember talking to someone years ago about why so many kids like like hockey and like playing goalie, for example. And this person yeah. said to me, and it really made sense. You feel like a superhero when you're a kid. You're putting on all this stuff. When have you seen anyone put on gear like this before? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah in comic books or in like superhero cartoons. That's what you must feel like as you're a kid putting all of this on. So I think that contributes to a lot of it too. I, um, for, for fighting now, the one thing, again, this is a byproduct of age, I'm sure. Cause I used to have no problem with junior hockey fights. I can't watch teenagers fight. And mm. knowing what I know now about the male brain and how it develops yeah. and 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 at what point it really matures, I 
I, I can't, I can't, I can't, I get really uncomfortable now. And listen, I've got, you know, I've got one close family friend, Ryder McIntyre, who's a family friend of, of ours, lives here in, in Stouffville. He plays on, he's got a hat trick the other night, Hawk, big hat trick, emptied that goal for the Hatter. Um, you know, he gets in a couple every single year and I'm like, okay, good job, kid. But inside I'm like, oh man, you know, your, your brain's not fully formed yet. Let's maybe hit pause and until you're, uh, until you're playing professional hockey here. But then I always catch myself and say, stop telling people what to do. Let people make up their own mm. mind. Yeah, you're on a spiritual. This is all spiritual. This to me is this is all fantastic. <laughs> it's exactly what I thought we'd talk about. Okay, so I'm going to float this by you. Um, in the last few years on social media, I've never seen so many virtuosic musicians, drummers, super guitar players, shredders of all kind. Um, these kids who've had access to the internet and have been able to yes get inside the hows and the how to's in the, in a way that back when you and I were trading video cassettes and I was trying to yeah. become a better musician, I was gleaning what I could from albums. And if I could get a visual representation of what it was, I was trying to play all the better, but those things were very, very rare. So fast forward to the 21st century where we are right now and the social yeah. media landscape and musicians that they, they've, they've, Virtuous musicians have never been more commonplace. I see this happening in the NHL right now too. With a, it feels to me like the players are skewing younger, and the yep. abilities are shocking all of a sudden. And now I wasn't paying close attention to hockey for some years. I will admit, um, like you, I was fanatical for the Oilers and the mid '80s era of hockey. That's when great. I had the cards, and that's when I was a, a fan. And I played road hockey at school, and I was very invested. So fast forward to to, to now. Um, the Connors is uh, this Austin Matthews <laughs> character, but these kids who generally yep. have no, there's, there's just no, um, there's nothing cumbersome about the outfit, the skates, anything anymore. These kids yeah. can flick the, 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 the puck with their skates. It's, it's, it's poetic how they're playing at this level. Um, what's happened? A a am I perceiving this correctly? Like I 100%. sort of have to believe that the internet is part 100%. of it that you yep. can watch and you can rewatch and rewatch and then you can go out and practice in your yard and figure out how you're going to do that. But the level now is so insane. It, it almost feels like, and, and it, I've been saying this in music as well. It almost feels like there's no room left. Like we got so good, so quick, all of a sudden yeah. we maxed out what the human potential really is. I can't see where we go from here. That's interesting too, because I've, it's a really, really good point. I've thought about it a lot and I've thought about it with music too. Cause I, I follow a lot of, uh, young musicians on Instagram, uh, who just shred and do things that I, I never, ever thought possible. And with them, I, I always, and maybe this is where it differs with sports. You can fill in the blanks for me here, Hawk. I always, I always think, yes, they can play. And I think of like, I was a big Frank Zappa guy, still am. And when Steve, mm -hmm. I was in the band, me he too. was, li he was listed as stunt guitar. All right, all the stuff that was yep. too hard. Okay, get get Steve Vai, to, you know, stunt guitar Steve Vai. So now, like everyone is stunt guitar now. Like now but I, yep. I always do wonder, you know, music having the ability to 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 play is one thing, but then there is the creativity gene, and I don't know where that comes from. Like I, I, I don't like, that's why I, I marvel at musicians, you know, Thelonious Monk, there ain't no wrong notes, man. Like everyone has like the same, you know, the, the same, you know, the, 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 the same language to, and the same words to choose from here. And you just put it a, a certain, or you just make it your own. Like, where does that part, you can play, you know, guitar, drums, whatever, piano, but to be able to create is I've always felt is a completely separate thing. Like I can marvel at these kids doing it. But do I mm -hmm. think they'll make for me the best music or music that I'll always have in my head for the rest of my life that I'll keep coming back to? Like I, you know, keep coming back to, you know, I keep coming back to speaking of Zappa, Watermelon and Easter Hay. I listen to almost every single day to me is like the perfect sad song. I don't know. It's a really comforting song too. Uh, Battlefords, I told you before, like I, there's a moment in every single Day about, since the first day I heard Battlefords, every single day, there's at least one moment where that's in my head. That is in my head and will be in my head forever. There, I will never know a day when that something, something from Battlefords is in my head. But as far as sports goes, um, there's a lot of players with a lot of skill. Absolutely true. 
but then being able to think the game part, like you can do all the skills you want and skate around all the cones and do all the Michigans you want and all these types of things. But the one thing that people continue to say, much like the creativity in music, can you play? Because playing is, you know, five players versus five players and two goaltenders, and you need to work with everybody around you. And it is that unique athlete in hockey that's able to marry high skill with an ability to play the game and not just try to freestyle or essentially play stunt guitar every time they're out Mm -hmm. there. Those players may be high skill, and we've seen tons of them, but they don't last. They don't last at all unless you know how to play. And that takes a long time, too. And that is really fascinating. I mean, I mean, we could wax poetic about Zappa because to me, Zappa is so big and so massive for me. But what I would like Hang to on, just can, can, can I ask you a question? The, can I ask you a quick, quick question sure. about Zappa? I always ask Zappa fans yeah. this. Roxy and Elsewhere was my favorite. What was yours? Joe's Garage is still my my go. It is, eh, yeah. Re- and I call myself a Zappa fan. I know three albums extremely well, or four albums extremely well. And when you. I'm not the kind of fan that knows all 80 or 100 or whatever there is. What, and so f- I don't even know what era of the record you're talking about. Early about 70s. So that that okay. was like Chester Thompson was in that band. Yep. Um, Ruth Underwood was in that band. Ruth like, Underwood, sure. Um, Napoleon Murphy Brock, George Duke. Oh, George Duke. George Duke George was Duke. like Nuts. Was just spectacular. Yep. Like, like I always loved the band. And this is probably true of all of Zappa's bands. I mean, you can tell me this, whether I'm on bass or off bass. He was the worst musician in every single band he was in. Yeah. Is that accurate? I would say in some ways he contained an unfathomable magic. The way he played solos on that SG, nobody sounds like him. And maybe this mm-hmm. actually is the lead into the question that returns to the whole stunt guitar originator, Steve Vai, okay. who in some ways was borrowing from Eddie Van Halen. But what I would say is that every shred kit I see on Instagram borrows heavily from Steve Vai. So he's borrowing, they're mm-hmm. borrowing heavily from the aesthetic and the, the the technological swagger that was introduced in full full color by a Steve Vai and a, and, and and arguably, um, well, not arguably, you know, uh, Eddie Van Halen first. I guess what I'm saying is is that somebody originates this. They invent it out of nothing, out of thin air. Steve Vai creates stunt guitar, and in some ways creates the way the guitar is going to be played for the next thirty or forty years. Even these kids who are playing at unfathomably super shred levels are still copying Steve Vai. So I guess the origins of the invention, that's interesting to me in art. Is I don't know, if, is it that interesting in hockey who originated this stuff yes. or yes. is just the pure athleticism the goal here? So, okay, so what's the move that all the kids are fascinated with right now? The Michigan. So the Mich- I'm so glad you brought this up. So the Michigan is the move where you're behind the net and you scoop up the puck and you tuck it. It's a, essentially just a high wraparound. Right? When you break yeah. it right down, it's a high wraparound. So, but all the kids love it. Like my kids, they, they kept working at it, working at it. And now they can all, all the kids can, can pick the puck up now. And we all sort of look at Mike Legg from, from Michigan and say, okay, he was the original. Well, no, he learned it from a guy in London who played in the, uh, in, in the minors in the early 90s. And that's who he picked it up from at a hockey camp. But Um, it's interesting when the 1972 summit series documentary came out that CBC put out a couple of years ago, um, they found footage of Yakushev from the Soviet team in practice doing that move. Now the question becomes, where did he learn it from? So we thought this was like a 1991 move. And then all of a sudden video emerges of this happening in 1972 at practice. And then we still, we think we've gone from the root to the fruit. No, 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 no. We're still going, we're still going back here. Right. Or the Peter Forsberg move, like the one hand sort of scoop that goes around the goaltender, Corey Hirsch and the, uh, and the Olympics and the poet, they called the postage stamp. Um, Kent Nielsen was one of my favorite hockey players of all time. The, the glorious Swedish hockey player, Kent Nielsen. He did that at the world championships in 1990 on John Van Biesburg, but because he didn't do it on as grand a stage as Peter mm-hmm. Forsberg did in the Olympics, we call that move the Forsberg, when really we should call it the Kent Nielsen. But I, it is a fast, like etymology is a big pursuit of mine uh, and finding like the origins of certain moves or certain plays or certain ways to think. And really, and I've always, I mean, you would know this a lot better than me. I've always looked at it when it came to music as musicians try, and I, I can, like, this is true of, of broadcasters. Like when I was starting out, 
I wanted to sound like Bob McCowan. And instead it turned into whatever this is. And I've always imagined that for musicians, they've, they've started out by trying to be someone or something else and then stumble into their own sound. Like what it, I think it was um, Miles Davis said something along the lines of it takes, it takes a long time until you figure out how you sound, how you sound or it takes, I'm, I'm really butchering the quote here, but Miles Davis essentially said it takes a long time to be yourself when you're uh when, yeah. when you're a musician i, I think i think it was miles davis who, who said that one um and then uh, as you used to say about john coltrane he practiced like he had no skill and just hammer it and hammer it and hammer it and hammer it and then you just sort of develop who you become but then i always think too like we're sort of trapped by our own experiences as well and our own other people that we've touched and the music that we've uh, listened to um and the people that we've met and the opportunities that we have like we're all still existing in these 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 boxes of experience i just think only now whether it's you know social media instagram shredders as you talk about they just have a bigger box and like you probably could have done that too if instagram was around when you were a kid and you picked up the axe for the first time you could have been one of those shredders once upon a time too i just think that everybody has a, a bigger frame to to exist in now if that makes sense yeah absolutely i mean i also regularly text my brother saying that if we'd had GoPro and YouTube, we'd be dead considering the things we <laughs> jumped off of on our bikes in the 1980s. If we were trying to go for virality, uh, I'm telling you, I would have lost limbs. But um, You know, I had a friend I had a friend of mine say something to me interesting about that the other day about how every day kids want to be recorded all the time and have their whole lives publicly. Yeah. He said, you know, it's interesting when we were kids, one of our great fears was being watched. Like we exist like not to be like, oh, we're being watched as oh, we're being spied on. Now the biggest fear for a kid is not being watched. It's like everything yeah, has like it. completely flipped. Like they want to live their lives out there. There are, there's no secrets, nothing. Everything that happens in their lives, they want broadcast. One of the fascinating things um, I came away uh, with when we met at that event, the 32 Thoughts event in Peterborough, was a, a, a few comments that came about how the big business aspect of the game, there was some allusion to management and team owners telegraphing possible trades through the media. All of a yep. sudden, you were on the phone getting the lowdown on something, but meanwhile, <laughs> three days later, it turned out you were being played just to oh, see... Yeah. You wanted to, what if we float this trade idea to the public? How does it play? And all of a sudden, you and others like you in the sports media are now sort of unwilling participants in a yep. in, in the business gameplay. And yep. I, that blew my mind. All of a sudden, I was like, oh, yeah. this guy really does see behind the curtain. Can you elaborate? Sure. Okay, so there's, um, and we just went through one of them. There are two times of the year where you really need to have your guard up, where you really need to try to figure out Okay, who's lying to me? One <laughs> is the trade deadline. Yeah, this is just like the business, right? One is the trade deadline, and the other is the draft, because there is so much deliberate miscommunication, or to your point, floating out of different ideas, trade proposals, etc., to see how it goes over. The other thing, I'll tell you what, the other thing that that teams will do to try and to try to find out who's leaking information from their team is they'll float out something phony to only one person in their organization to see if that gets out. Oh yeah, no, it's like, <laughs> that's the way it is. And so you kind of have to always have, like, it's, it's, it's weird Hawk. Like I understand why they do it. Um, but you really have to have your, your guard up and know your relationships. Well, like I'll give you, I'll give you a great example. So this is, Years ago. So I used to work with a guy by the name of Bill Waters, who for the longest time was an agent through the 70s, um, was a broadcaster, did uh, Toronto Maple Leaf games, and was also the assistant general manager for the Toronto Maple Leafs for a number of years under Cliff Fletcher. So he was the AGM and Matt Sundin uh, was in a contract negotiation. And Mike Zeisberger of the Toronto Sun called Bill. It's in the summer. He's got a, he's got a, a beautiful place on the shores of Lake Huchiching. And he called him and said, Bill, I'm just giving you the heads up as a courtesy. Uh, I've got all the details on the Matt Sundin contract. We're going to put it in the newspaper, the Toronto Sun, tomorrow. And Bill said, okay, tell me what you have. 
And Mike lays out like, okay, this is the deal. It's this many years. It's this much deferred money. This is the bonus structure. This is the total compensation, blah, 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 blah. And uh, there's a pause on the phone. And Bill says, well, Mike, you're wrong. And if you put that in a newspaper tomorrow, you will be humiliated. Your information, I don't know where you got it, but it's wrong. It's, uh, it's awful. And you are about to make a fool of yourself if you put that in the newspaper. And Mike Seisberger, true journalist that he is, said, I have faith in my source on this one. We're putting it in the paper. And so the next day, Matt Sundin's contract, Mike Seisberger puts it in his column in the newspaper. And then like two weeks later, the contract is official and Mike's numbers are right. So Mike Seisberger, the following summer, Bill invites him to his cottage and is walking him through his lovely, lovely cottage and says, come here, I want to show you a room. And uh, Mike tells him, okay, so he walks into the room and he's, there's a, there's a couch and there's a chair and there's a table and there's a telephone on a stand. And Bill says to Mike, 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 that's the chair over there that I was sitting in when I lied to you about the Matt Sundin contract. <laughs> and that <laughs> is the way it goes sometimes. Oh. Teams are desperate not to have that information out there. And uh, lying is such a strong word, but it is it is part of doing business. And you do get, you, you're right, like Hawk, sometimes you get dragged into it uh, unwittingly. Like, okay, I've heard this this rumor. Now there are ways, like there are ways to, to check on things. And, you know, sometimes it's, it's pretty obvious when you're getting played. Or, or getting duped, but there are, yeah, you know, there are certainly teams that will float out information. You know, I mean, not unlike, you know, politicians will float out to a favorite reporter, hey, put this out that uh, that uh, that our party is considering this as a as a essentially as a free focus test, right, for that political party to see how it goes over. We have to pay for the focus test, just put it in the in the in the piece and see how it goes over. So yeah, that that happens in in hockey. That's a as we like to say, hockey, an occupational hazard. How's that? I mean, was this always always the way, or is this sort of uh, is this is this you know the last ten or twelve twenty years? Like, I guess I think of you like you're trying to eloquently cover the magic and art of what's happening on the ice. Yet, like you've just said, unwittingly you've sort of been drafted into this sort of meta process of now you are somehow a conduit for a, a new game that's being played, which is a big business game, mm-hmm. and which is also fascinating in a way. And I think that probably it's interesting to be involved in it. I just, Mm -hmm. it just seems somehow accidental or surprising that all of a sudden in, in being a a sports broadcaster, you are also part of the, the, the conduit for this Mm -hmm. big business to operate and kind of breathe and, and off gas in a way that is like, very fascinating. So what I look at what I, I do is I try to explain as best I can, how this works like i look at this like my job is to explain to people how this works how this trade works how this game works how this organization operates why they make the decisions that they do essentially it's like the 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 peek behind the curtain right a little look under the hood Mm -hmm. this is how this thing operates now my argument or i guess maybe my my defense of my position in this industry is always the more information you can give fans about the sport that they love, the stickier they get to your product, the stickier they get. I mean, you know this in music, right? Give them a little peek behind, you know, who you are. All of a sudden your fans, like there's more flypaper there. Um, Sometimes it's uncomfortable for organizations. I understand that. Sometimes information gets out that makes their day-to-day existence uncomfortable. um, And I understand that too. But ultimately, I see my job as just explaining what is happening in the game of capital H hockey, which is not just what you see on the ice, but all the maneuvers that go on behind the scenes that leads to what you see on the ice. Essentially, try to explain as best I can the entire operation. Sometimes I'm successful, sometimes I'm not, but I try to give it a good shot every day. That's the takeaway I get when I listen to your podcast. I get that I'm being, again, it's human. When I listen to what you're it's, I feel, I feel wholly invited as a sort of a, you know, passive sort of arts and culture guy who is interested in hockey. I feel like I have a trusted friend 
who is explaining things to me in a way that I am not only just getting a vision of the game, but a vision of how the game works and and the moving parts behind the scenes. It's interesting you bring up the behind the curtain thing, because I often say that in the music business, anything in showbiz, once you've seen behind the curtain, you kind of seen behind all the curtains. You know what I mean? Like hmm. when I'm watching, you know, a, a, some sort of political thing on TV, I feel like it's a similar curtain. I, I know what's kind of happened for this moment to, to come to be, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I think what I wasn't anticipating being so surprised by what it is that you guys are dealing with outside of just calling like what you're seeing on the ice. And I, um, and then I'm going to step one, one further in this piece. And I, I don't know if I've crystallized it even in my own mind properly, but my sense, the takeaway was, is the, is the NHL a Canadian, is the business of the NHL, a, is it run with a Canadian instinct? It's such a Canadian game. And I find myself as a Canadian artist, spending a lot of time looking at how the instinct of the Canadian artist and the Canadian music scene differs from the American instincts and, mm-hmm. and really other cultural instincts as well. But the Canadian one in particular, because hockey is so, you know, is so particular to this country. And then when I was thinking about this big business stuff you're talking about, I, I thought, is, is the instinct of the business Canadian? Is it, does it have a folksy Canadian thing like behind the scenes? Like, am I making sense? You know what I'm uh, you trying are, to get at here? I, I do. And there's a lot of people uh, in the industry that are, I mean, a, there are a lot of Canadians that work in the industry at a lot of different levels. Uh, the game itself is becoming more international and specifically more Americanized. Um, and I, I look at it like this. Like I, for years, like when we were kids, I, I mean, I certainly felt this way. I could never understand why more countries didn't love hockey the way that we did. I always said, how come hockey's not more popular in the United States? How come hockey's not more popular, you know, uh, overseas? Certainly it's popular, you know, Finland and, and Sweden, et cetera. But, you know, like, why is it not more popular in Germany? Why is they have a very athletic culture um, and a lot of money and resources, et cetera? Why is it not more popular in Switzerland? Why is it not more uh, popular in, in, like, in a lot of other countries, but most specifically in the United States? And now that there's been a, a very deliberate movement to spread hockey in a lot of non-traditional markets in the United States, it's almost as if Canadians said, whoa, 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 whoa. We wanted you to like hockey, but we didn't want you to be better than us. We didn't want you to like it that much. We didn't actually mean for you to pick up sticks and love it the way that we have here in Canada. Whoa, 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 hold on a second. This is not what we bargained for, but the toothpaste, you can't put the toothpaste back in. Now, all of a sudden, like you go to all these tournaments, there's teams from Nashville, there's teams from California and teams from Texas and teams from like good, good hockey teams. And I'll tell you, like the time, like there is a transition happening right now. And that is from Canadian dominance on the international hockey scene to American dominance. And we saw it at the World of Juniors this year, and you see it at the draft every single year. Now, Canada is still not conceding a backseat to the United States. But right now, what we're starting to see is where once upon a time it was, it was you know, Canada and then the rest of the world. And every now and then Sweden would have a great team in Russia, etc. But now you're starting to see the dominance of the United States. And, they con- and the players come from a lot of the non-traditional markets where franchises went in about 20 or 30 years ago. It's starting to pay off. You know, when you go fishing, you go to the pond where the fish are. And that's always been the United States. Canada is tapped out on the men's side. I want to get to the women in a second. On the men's side, Canada's tapped out. And at the NHL level, Canada is tapped out. Given what it costs to own and operate a hockey franchise, an NHL franchise in Canada, there's no more markets. And I know it's tough for Quebec City to hear that, but already Winnipeg's in trouble. Right. We're all talking about season tickets and, you know, what what could happen if Winnipeg loses another franchise? How devastating would that be? But there are no more NHL markets here. There are still markets stateside. So from the men's side and the NHL point of view, there are no more markets. It's kind of tapped out in Canada. The place for investment is in the United States and the place for investment is in the women's side. Now, the women's side of things, that's where the growth opportunity is. Women's hockey in Canada is an insanely smart and burgeoning growth opportunity in 
hockey and it benefits the men too. And this is what I keep saying to my guy friends, the more girls to pick up hockey sticks, the more, you know, uh, women in their twenties and thirties, whenever you even considered it their whole life, but want to try it now that pick up hockey sticks, the more that, you know, young girls start to play hockey and play on, on great teams and develop into, you know, national players. And now there's the P, uh, PWA, uh, PWHL, excuse me, <clears throat> the PWHL, uh, a league for them to play in on a consistent basis. What you're going to see is there'll be more rinks made, equipment manufacturers will be healthier. Like at every single level, hockey is going to improve for everybody. And all of it is going to be because of the growth of women's hockey. That is the one big place that's ready to explode. And already there's been PWHL successes uh, in all uh, all six markets, specifically Montreal, specifically Toronto as well. The other markets are healthy and vibrant, putting thousands of fans uh, in the stands. You know, there's a they, they, they broke a record uh, in Toronto not, not too long ago for attendance at a women's game, 19,000, looking to break that maybe in the playoffs with a game at the Bell Center in Montreal, get over 20,000 fans to watch a women's game. So that is the one big growth uh, growth area for hockey in this country. But it does it still have that same folksy Canadian charm? Not as much as it used to, and it's getting less and less each year. But I don't I don't look at it as if this is like, oh, it's a cautionary tale, the big bad Americans that have come to steal Canada's game. I kind of look at it as a success story. Like this is something that Canada has successfully now finally exported to our neighbors south. And they love it and they embrace it. They have resources, they have tremendous athletes. And here's what scares, here's what scares Canadians about the United States getting this involved in hockey. Once upon like hockey, there's always been players, like American hockey players. The difference was the top American athletes always chose sports like track and field or football or baseball or basketball. Those were the top choices. And you know, further down the ladder, you got to hockey. But what you're seeing now, and this is frightening, top athletes choosing hockey. Austin Matthews could have been a football player, I mean, baseball player, whatever. Like he started hockey from scratch. There's no one. And Austin Matthews' family ever played hockey. He's the first one. He started from zero. He's just a great athlete. And there's a lot more hockey players like that in the United States. Those elite athletes are now starting to choose hockey first. That should scare everybody in the world. Long-winded way of saying, no, the folksy charm really isn't there the way it was even in the 80s when we fell in love with the, the Dynasty Oilers. Um, not to say that Canada is completely irrelevant. Listen, when you look at how much money is being generated in Canada uh, for hockey, it's still very important, but it is it is very much changing. What a beautiful and holistic and non-negative way of... Uh, it's great. ...crystallizing that. I appreciate it very much. It's fascinating what you've just said. And... Um, Are young kids dreaming about playing on other teams than the original six or whatever it was? Like, yes. are kids growing up? Yeah. So that's even that's happening now. Oh yeah. Hopefully, oh, I get yeah. to play on the yeah. Vegas Knights or whatever it is. That's a big one. That that's a big one. I mean, listen, uh, kids don't want to play, you know, where, wherever the the stars are, right? So you know, in Toronto, there's the Toronto Maple Leafs have a ton of fans. A lot of it's because Austin Matthews and Mitch Marner. But, you know, Sidney Crosby with the Pittsburgh Penguins, Alex Ovechkin with the, the Washington Capitals. And now there's this whole new generation, you know, like um, uh, I'll give you a, an anecdote here. Um, Elliot and I, the guy that I do the podcast with for all your viewers, Elliot Friedman and I, so this podcast that Hawk is talking about. And every year the NHL does what they call a players tour. And they do one in Europe for all the European players where all the rights holders go and do all their interviews and shoot their videos that show up on television for the year. And for the North American players, they used to do it in Chicago. Now they do it in Vegas every year. And this past year, so I was leaving and both uh, my kids, um, 14 and 12, only had one question. Are you going to talk to Connor Bedard? And I'm like, Crosby's there, like Matthews, like big, super. And all they cared about was Connor Bedard because they saw him at the World of Juniors and they saw all the, the, to your point, like essentially doing the guitar shred, but with hockey sticks and hockey bucks on Instagram and he is their hero. So I guess that's an original six team. So yeah, still with, with Chicago, but it's more about they attach themselves to players more so than the teams and wherever their favorite players are, that becomes their favorite team. They very much identify with the name bar, not the logo anymore. Did I dream this or did I hear that young players are 
um, reluctant to get onto a Canadian team because of the added pressure of no Canadian team having won a cup in a while. So all of a sudden you're, you're, you're receiving the heat from these fans who are expecting a miracle to, to sort of change fortunes in the, in the, yeah. in the decades that, so that, is that a real thing? Not a dream. Um, but I want to add a couple of things to that because that is Please part do. of it. That, that, that is part of it. So there are a lot of, um, a lot of hockey players that considering how the media glare is in all the Canadian markets, like that's not, that's not for them. It takes a special kind of player to thrive in a Canadian market. Like everybody said, like I've always maintained sort of half jokingly that the two hardest jobs in Canada are as follows. Number one, prime minister. And number two, starting goaltender for a Canadian NHL team. That's it. Those are the two hardest jobs in Canada because the scrutiny you face as a goaltender for a Canadian hockey team is unlike anything else in this country. Now, a lot of players are scared away by that, but I'll tell you there's an even bigger issue. And this is actually an issue that's happening right now. And that is concerning a lot of teams that aren't, that, that aren't in a no tax state. And that is whether it's Florida, whether it's Texas, whether it's Tennessee, whether it's Nevada, the presence of the no tax states, this is a salary cap NHL. And it's one where players also have to pay into escrow every single year. A lot of players, I would argue the, the, the majority of players are trying to keep as much money in their pockets as possible, knowing their careers are finite, right? Like they have a window here of between what, five to 10 years, if you're really good to make the most amount of money you're going to make in your entire life. So a lot of them prefer to play in tax-free states. That ain't Canada. That ain't New York. That ain't Massachusetts. That ain't mm -hmm. Illinois. Like that isn't these places. So the lure of playing in tax-free states, you can make the argument, gives those teams an unfair advantage when it comes to recruiting, when it comes to signing free agents. That, I can assure you, is an enormous draw for a lot of hockey players. There is also the pressure of playing for a Canadian market. And, you know, Brian Burke used to run the Toronto Maple Leafs and we worked together at Sportsnet for a number of years. And I still keep in touch with Burke. He's a wonderful guy, but he would always tell me, you would be surprised, Jeff, how many Canadian hockey players have every single Canadian market on their no trade list because they just want to play in the States, want to make the most amount of money they can and stay out of the big glare and stay away from the pressure. Because in Canada, you're a hockey player 24 seven. You go get a cup of coffee in the morning. Everyone knows you, you're a hockey player. A lot of U.S. markets, mm. you're a hockey player at the rink, and then you leave, you're just a citizen. That's it. I know that um, we don't have you for forever, and this conversation just gets more fascinating. Can you sum up for me, you know, when I was young and I was beautiful and all of that, and I was on TV, <laughs> and it was like, wow, look at this hunk doing his thing. And then, you know, I... In, there's this sense I didn't really age out of the industry. The industry changed so massively that there wasn't much music and all these other things. But but I was very cognizant of the fact that like there's an age range that makes sense to be on much music and to be on popular radio. Yeah. You know, I'm 49 now and I still have my job and I'm still thriving and I still love what I do and I feel every bit as effervescent as I ever have. I have friends, professional athletes who have retired out and what a the hockey thing is interesting because you've been dragged to the rink ever since you were a kid uh you were four years old you're getting yes. up at 3 a.m or whatever you're getting to the rink at five yes and then you hit that wall at the end of your career can you in some ways like can you can you give us a picture of what you see in terms of what happens to a pro athlete who is given who's been in this trajectory uh, and and at and at breakneck speeds and it just comes to an end is that how yep. it looks what, it's harsh who's you're doing right. that right is you're right. What, it's what harsh. It, it's it's it makes me ache inside this thing. This 100%. piece makes me ache. And the transition is really tough. And that's why I think a lot of the the smart ones retire before they retire. I remember Kelly Rudy telling mm -hmm. me this once. He said, "The minute you say the word retirement or think retirement in your head, part of you retires." Because think about mm -hmm. when you're a kid, like you don't even think about it. You don't even consider it. But he said, "The minute I thought of the word, part of me already retired." It's not a bad thing. 
but I think you just need to prepare yourself for this inevitability that these same checks aren't going to be coming every two weeks for the rest of your life. And your life is going to change. There's going to be a new you and there's going to be certain new demands that are placed on the new you. Like it's happened to you all, all the way up, like every different you know aspect of your life. When you were single, there was one you and then you got married and had a family. There's another you um, that, you're, that your family needs. But then eventually hockey's done with you and it's time to move on to the next phase of your career. Some guys stay in hockey. Some want to coach. Some can't cut that umbilical cord, and that's all they know, and that's all they love, and that's fine. You want to stay in it. Others don't want anything to do with it. Generally, the rule of thumb that I always recommend, everyone is different, is take time away from the game. See if there really is a lure. See if it's a passion or a habit. You know, like if you just might think that, okay, I always have to do this because it's all that I've ever known. But if you can walk away from it for a year and you don't miss it, then it's no longer a passion. And you know that, you know, and, and, and if you don't even try, then it's just a habit and, and, a, and a routine that, that you've gone through. Um, but it is hard. It, it really is hard for a lot of these players, that, that transition, because what do I do now? And, and one thing, too, and you mentioned this, and I think this is a really important point to hang on to. These guys have had their lives structured for them since they were eight, nine years old. Here's your day. Here's what you do. Everything is, and here's when you can have your meal. Here's when you can have your workout. Here's when you can have your nap. Here's when you can play your game. Here's when you're going to have this protein shake. And here's when you're going to have for dinner. And here's when you go to go to bed and blah, 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 blah. You have just training and that. That's been their whole lives. And then after that, freedom. And what do you do? Like that can be terrifying, right? You know, Eric Fromm used to talk mm -hmm. about, you know, there's two types of freedoms, freedom to and freedom from. Freedom to be able to do something and freedom from having to have to make those terrible choices where all the consequences are now on you for those choices. And that kind of freedom, when you've had everything structured your whole life, can be absolutely terrifying for a lot of these guys. And it is better now because there are a lot of programs now that the, the players have access to and that the um, uh, the players can use for their own benefit. But that freedom away from the game is scary for a lot of guys. And a lot of guys make a lot of bad choices and a lot of dark choices. Mm -hmm. And it costs them a lot. And the tolls are just awful. And there's plenty of, you know, trails of, you know, broken families along the way after they get that freedom that they generally never chose usually the mm. game is done with you before you're done with the game very few yeah. walk out you know on, on their own i guess very very seldom you get to to choose your exit um so yeah it's 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 absolutely tough it's it's hard it's it can be really cruel and i, I think that now and a lot of agents will advise their clients so like i gotta i gotta say a word about about agents here because i know sometimes they can get a get a get a bad rap but what a lot of agents will do now, full service agents, is they'll really prepare financial practices, uh, financial portfolios rather for a lot of the players and start to provide for them a, a sort of baseline of what your life is going to be like when you're done playing hockey. So there are more opportunities than before, but you're right. Like that can be, that can be mentally, but put it this way, you've gone from playing in front of 20,000 people to just doing everyday stuff. And I can assure you, whether you're an ex NHLer or a guy like you and me, nobody cheers when we take out the garbage. That's our life now. And that becomes their life. And it is a profoundly different thing for them to experience. And it's hard for a lot of them. Absolutely. It's a great question. It's a great question. Amazing. Um, I was working at the CBC around the time of Battle of the Blades and I oh, was yeah. hearing oh, yeah. through, through, through the pipeline that the, the players were absolutely loving being back in the competitive universe of, 100%. And, and having a structured life again and being back into athletics. And yep. Like you say, I realize now that, you know, getting old and funny looking in music, like it's not the same as sport. It really isn't. Like sport spits you out whether you want to go or not. And that must be a, 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 a something brutal on the spirit that I'm so grateful that it's looking like I'm not ever going to maybe have to reckon with anything like anything like that. Um, can, I, can, I, can I drop one so, thing in here? Can I drop one thing in here? I, I just want to make, make sure that I, that, I, that, I, that, I, that I exhaust this one as much as I can. Yeah. Um, that is, it, you're, you're right that it, that it does spit you out. 
Um, I've always, and I've told my, my kids this, who my, my boys play, I've always said, you know, use hockey. Don't let hockey use you, you know, use it to make friends, use it to travel, use it to have new experiences, use it as a tool to do something. Don't just let this sport use you. And hmm. I remember having a conversation with uh, a close friend of mine, Cassidy Sove. Uh, she's a wonderful goaltender playing in Finland right now. She played with the national uh, program before. Um, really, and, and wonderful, A, wonderful person, B, really thoughtful person as well. And she said the best advice that she ever got to put everything into perspective for her is one of her college coaches. They're having a conversation about the game. So many coaches talk about the game. And this coach said to her, you know what you really need to remember? Hockey will never love you back. It won't. You can love hockey your whole life. Hockey will never love you back. And I think that is such a smart thing. You can love it and that's fine. But at the end of it, hockey's not going to love you back. It won't. It'll end and it could end harshly. Hmm. And what about Canadian sports media? What's, what's, what about you, Jeff? Oh, geez. I don't know. Like, <laughs> we all, we all I, have we'll, the sort we'll of just... Damocles over our head at any time. I mean, I love what I, I love this, but again, I always look at it, Hawk, like it's, it's a very accidental career. Um, and I, I, I honestly, I, I don't know what I'd be doing tomorrow if it were all over today. Uh, I will tell you though, I always loved, like I used to work at a cemetery, uh, well through university and I loved it. Um, I could work in the death industry like that. I'm very comfortable, uh, around it. I'm very comfortable around, you know, funeral homes and cemeteries. I find them really relaxing and soothing. I've never found any of it. Cre like that would be. I'm probably too old to, to start to go back to school for it now, but I could probably do that one day. But as far as as far as Canadian media goes, as, as far as I'm concerned, like as long as I still have wonder and as long as I'm still curious, then I still want to do this. And I'm, I'm still curious and I, I still wonder and I still have, you know, like a, a genuine curiosity and, and love for this. And I like I don't think that I've figured it all out, like the concrete hasn't hardened here, mm. like at all. Like, I, I still don't think that I've come close to, to figuring any of it out. Um, the, only, the only thing that I think I've, I've figured out um, from covering hockey as long as I have is that you can't lie to players. Players know who belongs and who doesn't belong and who's good and, and who's not good. After that, I cannot tell you with 100% certainty anything. And that's fine because I think it's always... I think it's a game that's like every other sport or music um, is always evolving and is always changing. And I'm never going to be one of those. Oh, it was better back in oh 20 years ago. This is hockey. It was like I always, I always, I, I kind of. I'll tell you, Hawk. One of the things that I always try to re remind people is that I'll tell you, oh, it was so much greater. The, the you have to play the the way they did 30 years ago and have to keep up the same traditions as they did and think of the tradition of hockey and that's why we have to do things. Man, tradition is peer pressure from dead people. You know, I, I, I really believe that. And as as long as I can hang on to that, I think, I think I'll be okay. Tradition is just peer pressure from dead people, Hawk. Uh, I think I saw something on Instagram, uh, 32 Thoughts in New York City. You had a banner <laughs> in Times Square. Thank so you, Amazon. Thank you, the, Amazon. The podcast is... <laughs> So it's getting some, yeah. I mean, it's doing well. And it does well. Like, of course it does well because I think you're a phenom and, and it's nah. been, I, this is, this is all I needed to have is a, is a one hour, eight minute plus chat with you to, to figure out, you know, you brought up the curiosity piece and I will let you go. That's a big one for me. Curiosity is, mm -hmm. is the essence of greatness, you know, and I think your sort of philosophical background, you've more or less been echoing that, um, you know, that Socratic, you know, you know, the, the, the truly wise people know that they know nothing, you know, Correct. and yeah. um, this to me is elemental and the most exciting part of being alive. And in many ways, why I wanted to do this podcast, because highly individualized, fascinating people, I realized after years of thinking I was a misanthrope that when I'm one on one with people, I fucking love people. Like, especially the ones who are curious and yeah. whose lights are really bright. And it's an exquisite thing to engage the human who has that deep curiosity and that to me curiosity it it wards off aging it wards off disease it curiosity totally agree. is a totally agree totally totally agree and uh, curio curiosity and wonder 
right? Like I, I still, like I'll, I'll tell you, I, I try to do this and I'm, I'm really, really bad at it. But uh, when, I, when I listen to music, what I try to do is listen to this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to butcher this. I'm going to explain this so poorly. Please be kind. He, here's what I try. To, I try to listen to the sound of vocals and not hear the words because I just want to hear the sounds of a voice, but not necessarily the word. Am I, I'm not doing a good job of saying Amen. this. I, like I, no, that's what I, that's what I that's what I'm try that's what I try to do because I'm I don't want to just marry myself to this sound coming out of this person's mouth means this I just kind of want to play with that sound in my head and to mm. me that's part of the curiosity and wonder and I would you know always trying to you know, go back to like an, an, a, 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 ch a child's mind and I'd try to imagine what music must have sounded like before I understood language right that complete child's mind of experiencing things for the first time. I try to do it whenever I hear music that has uh, singing in it. I'm really bad at it. Yeah. Every now and then it clicks for me, but I have a hard time. I wish I could just turn off the language part and just hear the sound of a song. You know what I mean? Well, I'm, I know a million percent. It's because our first language was not language, you know? Our first language was this curiosity, this wonder, mm -hmm. this relationship to texture and feeling and and those exquisite sort of spiritual things. Like before we learned to talk, we were probably far more in touch. And everything you said resonates very deeply with me. In fact, a lot of the discussions I have with songwriters on this podcast, one of the things I like to ask about, like, do you prioritize the meaning of the word or the way the word sounds? I always say words mm -hmm. that are flavorful, textural, chocolatey, delicious I choose the sound and texture of a word way before I would choose a word that has to have some sort of succinctness to it. Now, of course, if you can have both, that's the ultimate. But yeah. if, if you're down to the wire as a songwriter and it's like you get to choose a word that feels nice in the mouth versus a word that gets the point across, I always choose the word that feels nice because that's because what I'm talking to you about, you're feeling. You're, that, is, that is touching you because you are that curious wonder, that person who's still got that child in them who yeah. is seeking for the greater truth than what is the language the language it's not the greatest truth it really isn't see that that to me is fascinating and and reassuring um because i've, I've always i've always felt that you know it's that uh the the, the sense of nonsense right that hmm. you know just play with uh, language in song and having it, have it it married to melody to me is one of the most beautiful things. And I don't care if, if, if I don't care if, if, if the words make, make sense or not, because to me, it's just, what does that song make me feel like? What does that music make me feel like, you know? And I just want to have that type of emotional experience to it. I don't necessarily, and again, I wonder if this, cause I'm 50, I'm going to be 55 in July. I wonder if this is a product of age where, you know, there's the, the, the old um, a Buddhist saying of, you know, when you're, when you're young, a mountain is just a mountain, and then you get older, and mountains become metaphors for other things. And by the time you're older, the mountain just goes back to being a mountain again, right? And I just, I just wonder if that's just sort of a byproduct of that. And I just want them, I just want the mountain to be a mountain. I just want the song to make me feel something. Bless you, Jeff Merrick. I really appreciate you doing this. You've been very generous, and uh, what a great chat. Um, yeah. I'm can a real I, fan. You're can, a real wonder. I'm really uh, grateful that you're out there doing what you're doing and bringing this humanity to, uh, to, to, to watching and, and, and telling stories about hockey. I think it's incredible. Can I leave you with a story? It's my favorite story. Please do. It's a very quick one and I love telling it. It was a little boy. One day went up to his mom and said, mom, when I grow up, I want to be a hockey player. The mom looked down at her son, smiled and said, son, that's great, but you can't do both. This has been a lot of fun, Hawk. Thanks so much for having me on. I really appreciate it, Jeff. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> that, I didn't know you were going to leave me with a Buddhist cold. Here, <laughs> oh, yeah, the mountains. Oh, yeah. I told you it's going to be pretentious, dude. Trust me. It's...
Ridiculous. I loved it. <laughs> okay. Thanks so much, man. Really, yeah, really. No, so great. no problem. My pleasure. Any, listen, dude, anytime. I would love to do this again, like any, any time. And um, if you don't mind next time, if we, if we get a chance to do it, if I could ask you about music more. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? What we'll do, because honestly, we open up the, the Frank Zappa floodgate. Like for me, he's just so big for me. It's just a big, he's such a big deal. Um, and uh, this is, this is, we'll call the podcast is done now. Uh, but yes, you're, you, I didn't know you were a Frank Zappa fan. I saw huge, you at the. Um, huge, huge, yeah. huge Zappa fan. I've, uh, I, I never saw Frank. Um, he passed before Thank I got you. to go to any shows. Uh, I've been to uh, Dweezil's pro, uh, shows a, a number of times. Um, always love those. Um, I'm, geez, was my old drum teacher, a guy by the name of Mark French, who played on Casino with Blue Rodeo. That was his only sort of claim um, uh, to fame. Um, he's the guy that turned me on. We had drum classes on Queen Street near Spadano, a old place called the Toronto Percussion Center. And uh, mm. he would just give me a different album to listen to every week, right? Like here's here's something from Louis Belson. Here's Buddy Rich. Here's here's Chester Thompson. And he handed me Roxy and Elsewhere, and I was like, this is. Like, I heard you know, Village of the Sun. And I was like, oh, where is this? Be? I've never heard anything like this in my life. And ever since then, it's just been like the pursuit of of of, of anything Zappa. And like legitimately, like I listen to. A watermelon and Easter hay. So I listened to it this morning when I was out walking the dog. Like every chance I get, I just find that because you mentioned Joe's Garage, I just find that to be like the most beautiful, beautiful piece of music that that Frank ever produced in this like incredible catalog of like genius material. But watermelon and Easter hay is is mine. I just love it, love it, love it. Um. So 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 did I miss you? Just said you were taking drum lessons. Is that right? Yeah, played drums for a number of years. Yeah, until okay, uh, okay until so was about... and you were hanging out with Danny Carey the other night. I saw you know drums yeah. are my first instrument. So for me, like, <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. Oh, drums are your first. Yeah, that's I, my whole intention. I I sacrificed my my entire adolescence to try and become a super drummer that would move to Toronto and become like a drummer for hire. The whole singer oh, yeah. and the band thing was not was not in the plan. So even the fact that you know drummers, even when you pulled Chester Thompson out of thin air, I was like, holy shit, this guy, oh, he's he goes Chester, deep because Chester was awesome. I mean, when you look at in many ways, Zappa, but I was a, a Coburn fanatic mm -hmm. as well. Uh, that's who, who I kind of got my songwriting thing from. But anyway, those guys and others staying others, Peter Gabriel, like them who hired the best of the best, the cream of the crop to pop their bands. Those Omar were, Hakim was staying was the best. I saw I saw that band at Kingswood. It was uh, uh, Branford Marsalis, Daryl Jones, yes. Omar Hakim. Uh, who else was in? It was just uh, like it was Murderer's Row. It was like just destroyed. yeah. Kenny uh, Kenny Kirkland. Who's Kenny no Kirkland? Past. Yes, uh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and that so the heavy, drum solo yeah. and that drum solo and I burn for you was they, burn for oh, you. <laughs> I remember seeing that. Like, what the hell am I watching? This is the most incredible thing. I just, so I've just been a huge Omar Akeem fan. Yeah, Weather Report, all of it. Oh, yeah. Oh, fuck. Do you know Larnell Lewis? Yes, of course. From Halifax. No, he's he's from Toronto, but... Who am I um, thinking of then? He's Larnell a super drummer. We had, we had, we featured his music on, uh, on the podcast once. Uh, why did I think he it's was from Halifax? True. He's another super drummer. We, I yep. just literally two days ago had a... 30 minute discussion about Omar Akeem and <sighs> uh and Manu Kache and all because where can I these, hear this? These guys were similar to in what you're talking about the hockey, the Michigan thing, and how this sort of emergence of like sh shredders. Like, yeah, we were just talking about how in the 80s, Dave Weckl and other drummers in yeah, that I remember era, Dave, Weckl, yeah, yeah, they, yeah. Dave Weckl was like to me, he topped out like he was he was everything to me, and and in, in a way, kind of created a drum universe that was untouchable. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, drums will never evolve past this. And it took about 30 some odd years. And I think the internet and social media and our ability as monkeys to sort of watch each other incessantly yeah. on repeat and figure out how we did the tricks we did. And I think in some ways that's where we've come to this sort of shredder universe we now live in because it all borrows from Weckl in the same way that a lot of the shred universe borrows so heavily from Steve Vai and Eddie Van mm -hmm. Halen. And it's just funny what, who gives birth to this creative instinct that then the athletes come by and they can kind of, they can make a meal out of yeah. the artistic statement of somebody who also had paired with it this sort of athletic approach to the instrument. Anyways, man, 
Well, hang on. Let me ask one more, one more drum question. Were you a Vinnie Colaiuta fan? Yeah. No one played with Absolutely. no one played with time for me the way they call you did, or the way maybe I say it better. No one cut time. Does that make? I don't, I'm not yeah. using like proper musical terminology. I'm just like this is how I feel. No one like cut time he, like Vinnie Colaiuta did. I agree. He seems somewhat immune to immune to time, but also of time. You know, and I think in my spiritual life, you know, I'm looking at even time as this sort of linear time as a construct that we've grown up with that I know don't even know if I any longer believe, but, but, yeah. but Vinnie Kaliuta's relationship to time is so elastic and with a technique so thorough and extraordinary, there's no, there's no, there's no locked door for, for, for yeah. Vinnie Kaliuta. Yeah. So as a kid watching Vinnie play, and I, again, I was just talking to Larnell Lewis about this, like when you do reach a level of proficiency where any any statement you want to make from that instrument is yours to make because there simply is no closed doors anymore. You've done the work. Your your connection to that instrument is is so pure. And I think that a Vinny was in some ways, unlike a Dave Weckl who was never cool and didn't play on cool records, was just he played great. Vinny was like the punk who played with Zappa, the punk who played with Sting, the punk who could play rudiments faster than everybody, and then like turn time inside out and still make it groovy and sexy. Like he, he is still copied as well. Like he is still. Kaliuta is, yeah. Those guys, oh my God. Kaliuta, Weckl and Gad are still revered as like the three elder statesmen of how drumming evolved from, you know, the Louis Belson meets rock meets like that whole fusion era. I don't know if you were a Chick Corea fan. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Went down that. Yep. So. Yeah, that was, it's just everything to me. <laughs> Absolutely everything to me. Can you do me a huge everything favor? Everything to me. Can I still. A, can you do me a huge favor? Yeah. If you ever come across something you think I need to listen to, can you just send me a quick text and say, go listen to this? Or I was listening yes. to this. Just don't, you know, I'm not asking you to think every day. I don't need like, but just yeah, like yeah, yeah, every now and then yeah. if I could pass through your brand, like, hey, I'm going to send this to Merrick. You might find this interesting. Yeah, drum specific or just some anything fascinating. Anything, anything. Okay. Because I I don't have I, I don't I, I like to, just to be blunt I don't have the time to do the anthropology anymore. I just like it's no doubt. so it's so much hockey man. Oh, it, every night and I I'm the guy that still feels guilty if I don't see every last game every night. Like oh, I can't miss I can't miss I can't miss or also be a I mean fraud, I even watch you the tweeting next day. like yeah it's stupid yeah I know, it's dumb. <laughs> But that's because you've, too much. You, you're too seeking much. a level of excellence on the regular. That's why That's why uh, you're, you're one of the good guys. Uh, I appreciate it. You, you read that just as I wrote it. Thanks, Hawk. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what? You've got a game to watch in seven minutes. Is that right? Uh, it started about 20 minutes. It's, just, it's Winnipeg, Washington. It should be a blowout for the Jets, but I should probably get on that. Well, just uh, actually, quick. I want to watch Rangers so and Devils what, tonight. Winnipeg is at... Risk of losing their team. I thought the team was n number one or something. There's about zero. Well, I shouldn't say zero. There's not a level of corporate support in Winnipeg that's really sustaining this right now. It's been real. This has kind of been the story of the corporate community that talked a lot when uh, when they when they got the franchise from Atlanta that haven't really backed it up with their money. Plus, the organization themselves have really disconnected themselves from the fans. Like the customer service experience for the Winnipeg Jets and uh, Winnipeg Jets fans has been awful. It's been abysmal. And now they're seeing like they have these they have these nights where, you know, half the rink comes dressed up as an empty seat. It's bad. It's bad. What? Yeah, I know. And it should be like they don't have the biggest barn, so they should they should sell it out every night. Like it should be it should be a packed house. But there's they've really created and I think it's just a, a lot of it's just billionaire arrogance. They've really created a, a disconnect between the hockey team and the fan base. And I think they're starting to try to change that now. And they're trying to sort of publicly shame a lot of corporate Winnipeg into like, okay, you talked a good game when we first showed up and it was hot. Well, now it's time to sustain us here or else we may be gone. Right? I know. It doesn't make sense to me. But I know. <clears throat> I know that doesn't make sense to me, but like, that's it. Like we were talking about, like, you know, the, uh, how it's not really a Canadian thing anymore, the NHL. And it's, you know, I'll tell you, there's, 
There's a chance that the Arizona Coyotes move to Salt Lake City for as early as next year. But the NHL will go back to Arizona. It's too big a market for them to ignore. They will go back. And, you know, how awful would it be if the Winnipeg Jets lose their team to Phoenix again? <clears throat> Crushing blow. It's funny you say that because I've just assumed, because I know that city so well. Um, the last time I was there, I stayed at a condo like across the street from the MTS or whatever. I think it's called that. Anyway, First Canada Center now. I was under the, I had uh, visions of like throngs of Winnipeggers, like so glad that A, the team's back and B, it's doing well, that like you would, like it just would have been a packed house every night. I had no idea no. that there was some disconnect. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's. I mean, you ask any of the any of the Winnipeggers, like the season ticket, like their their season ticket holder base has has dwindled because you know there's been horrible customer service. They're really like I know the NHL sets a lot of parameters for what you're allowed to do by way of game operations and you know sponsorship activations, but still other teams do fine with it. It's just that I think that Winnipeg, honestly, has just been kind of lazy and surfed on the idea that ah, Winnipeggers are lucky that we're back. Just you know. Pull some tree off the money and come see a Winnipeg Jets game. And that doesn't fly anymore. Like you have to provide an experience now for fans. The game's not just enough anymore. You know, you can't just have a game on an organ. They and by the way, I think Winnipeg still has the original organ from the WHA. I th- which is one of my favorite things in the NHL. They still have the same organ from the WHA in the 70s, still at that barn. That's cool. Yeah, man. That's cool. Yep. I love it. What, an, what a pleasure talking hey, to you, Jeff. Thanks for having me. I really, really appreciate this. And anytime, man, I'm happy to do it. I'm uh, I'm a big fan. Uh, I'd like to call you a friend. Um, and this has been well, a big same. It's a cool conversation. Really cool conversation. And I never get to talk like it's, this, uh, which is it's, fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I'm going to have you back because um, I feel like there was a few roads that we wanted to go down. Um, one of them being that there's been enough of little breadcrumbs in the conversation that leads me to believe that between veganism, yoga, and some of your, <laughs> some of your stoicism and yeah. spiritual, there's some obvious spiritual leanings there. Maybe we'll go there. Cause am I, am I right? Am I picking up all? Oh yeah. Right yeah. Stuff yeah. Here? Let me, let me, let me, let me do a ay- ayahuasca ceremony and then I'll come on after. How about that? <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Bless you, Jeff. Thanks again. Awesome. Thanks Hawk. Be good. Stumble Forward is an Isadora Media production and is hosted by Hawksley Workman and produced by Jennifer Cavanaugh. Be sure to subscribe and follow the Stumble Forward. You can support the podcast at patreon.com slash Hawksley Workman. Thank you for listening. Stumble Forward, Stumble Forward, the Stumble Forward.